Thank you, Rhonda. Well, welcome to First United Methodist Church. My name is Jerry Ragsdale, and I'm glad you're here this morning. I'm going to begin this morning with telling you one of my fondest memories as a child. I loved going to my great-grandmother and great-grandfather's house. It was a small house, not much room in there, picture of wood stove in the middle of the room. Uh, my great-grandfather at this time uh, that I can remember was not very mobile. He had lost his sight, but he always sat in a blue chair kind of behind the stove in the corner. And what I loved, why I loved going to visit them was my great-grandfather was a master storyteller. Now, I don't know if it was true or not, half of them. My dad says they weren't, but, but he always had a story to tell. I don't recall there being a TV in that house. There may have been. If there was, it was never on because there was no need because grandfather would always entertain us by telling his stories. This morning, we continue our sermon series on our membership matters. We're talking about being a witness, being a storyteller. If you're joining us in the sanctuary, I'd ask that you pick up the yellow card in front of you that you would sign in and let us know of your presence. If you're joining us online, you can go to our website, fumcmonet.org, go to the worship section, and you'll find a place to check your attendance there. We want to know that you're with us, that you're joining us today. I believe that there is something in this service that we have planned that will enhance your story with God. I want you to stand this morning. I want you to greet each other as you do that. Is there a storyteller in your family? Tell that person about it that you greet. <laughs> All right, as you make your way back to your seats this morning, I ask that you remain standing. Our first hymn we're going to begin with is How Great Thou Art. And I'm going to ask the ladies, ladies, if you'll sing the second stanza, guys, we'll jump in on the refrain of that second stanza. How Great Thou Art. <laughs> Sparing, sent him to die. 
I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly buried he bled and died to take away my sin this leads my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou offerings, some things to let you know about, and you may have seen some on the welcome stand. You might have also gotten one in the mail. This is what the pledge card for 2024 looks like. You might be thinking, oh, that's so old-fashioned. Why does this church collect pledges? Well, for one, they're anonymous, okay? We're not doing it because we want to know who's given what, and we're going to check up on you, and we're going to send you a monthly progress letter to see if you kept your commitment. Nope, that's not what we do here. Perhaps a lesson from the Chinese language is instructive. In Chinese, the word to write something and the word to believe something are one and the same. Such that if you write it down, you're saying, I believe this. You're saying it's true. And we believe that it is important, I think taking a lesson from the Chinese and human psychology, that if you write something down, it makes it that much more real, tangible, and important. And your giving is very important. Your giving moves ministry. So that is why we do pledge cards. Is because there's something very important about the act of prayerfully considering before God what you could give in the next calendar year and writing it down. Even if God and you are the only ones who know it, which is our hope, that, that they're all anonymous. That's why if you get this in the mail, yes, it has your address on it. You're supposed to cut that part off when you turn it in. And you can turn these in at the baskets at the back of the room. You can turn these in by bringing them to the church office. You could turn it in by mailing it. If you do that, don't use a return address. Again, anonymous. Why pledge? Another reason is because our church's finance leadership needs a vague idea, at least, of what resources might be available in 2024 so they could prepare a responsible budget. That's why. It, it helps them to have a, at least somewhat of an estimate of how much we could spend in what areas. And these are important areas that have important impacts, such as we are looking at purchasing a second church-owned van next year. You might remember we had a great big old diesel bus, and it was old. It was about 25 years old. And we sold that, and we're looking to replace that with a newer uh, vehicle that's also more friendly for many different people to drive. That takes your pledging, friends. If, if we don't think we have the resources available to do that, we won't. And that would be unfortunate because on Wednesday nights, every week, we consistently need two vans. Right now, we're having to make do with people giving rides in their own private cars, which is doable but not ideal. So things like that, vision for the next year, are why we pledge. And so you can... Uh, Turn those in any time before November the 1st at the baskets. Also at the baskets, you could put your offering uh, in check, check or cash. 
You could give online if you want to do credit or debit card. And, and every gift matters. Every gift is honoring to God. And there should be uh, in the next bulletin a financial update for those who are wondering. We also post that online of how the church is doing financially. As Jerry said, though, we are doing a, a recommitment and a remembering of our membership. And the vows are up there, if you ever forget them. Last week, we talked about prayers. We did post-it note prayers. If you weren't with us last week and you came in, you're thinking, why aren't there post-it notes all over the place? That's because somebody prayed there. And you could do that. If you weren't here last week, you get you a post-it note from the welcome stand. You can write or draw a prayer on it and post it someplace. Or if you were here last week and you want to do another one, you can. But if you're looking around, you see there's some on the prayer rails here. You'll see them throughout the building. That was our prayer exercise last week. Here is the way you're offering prayers today. You have an index card in the pew rack in front of you. Or if you need an extra one, go ahead and take that from the welcome stand. Today we're asking you to write encouraging notes and prayers for Matthew Wilson. He is a member of our congregation who remains deployed, and he's almost at the end of it. He has about a month left, and sometimes that last month can be the hardest because he's close to coming home, should be home for Thanksgiving, but not there yet. So we're going to write some encouraging notes for him, and so you can, you can write your note. If you're on, home online, you could do this too. Uh, just bring it by the church office before Tuesday noon. That's when these are going to be mailed. Okay, so you could write your encouraging note or draw a picture for Matthew Wilson. You could put these in the baskets as you exit today or bring it by the church office. Again, if you need post-its, if you need index cards, if you need a pledge card, they are at the welcome stand, all of those. And you help yourself to that and coffee if you need it at any point. So you have an opportunity to offer your prayers today and offer some encouragement to uh, Matthew as he is serving us in our country, and we are appreciative of all that he is doing. I'm going to give you a quiet moment to prayerfully consider your own offering to God, what that looks like, and then I'll pray a spoken prayer. At the end of that, I invite you to join me in the prayer commonly called the Our Father Prayer, and if you want the words for that, it's at the back of the hymnal, 895. It's the traditional version that uses trespasses. So let's pray. Jesus, we lift before you, Matt Wilson, and all those who are serving our country. Thank you for uh, their willingness to say yes to the needs of our military, and we ask that you would protect them, guide them in their decisions, encourage them when they feel down, and, and we pray that our notes will, will help in that, Jesus. We also pray that you would bring Matt safely back here to Monet soon. Jesus, we pray in thanksgiving of all that you have provided, of our health, of our loved ones, of the, the meal we ate this morning, of the car we used to drive, Jesus, of the technology that helps us to be together online. We thank you for all these things. You are the provider and giver of all good things. So now as we give back to you, and as we, we pray ahead and dream ahead about what you will do through this church in 2024, we ask your guidance to give. Help us to trust you. Help us to give willingly, knowing, Jesus, that when we place it in your hands, it honors you and helps us grow in our faith. And Jesus, I pray for all who, who are giving that they will find you faithful, and I know they will. So Jesus, we trust you. We give you our offering today, and we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand for our operatory response. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God, the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ, whose power uplifts. Praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Alleluia. saying praise God from whom all blessings flow. The word of God in 2 Peter 1 says this, by his divine power the Lord has given us everything we need for life. Through his life, th excuse me, through his honor and glory he has given us his precious and wonderful promises that you may share, that you may witness, that you may story tell his divine nature. I love to tell the story. Tell 
beautiful thing about the story of Jesus is that while it is an old, old story, and it is history, it's not just that. It's not just in the past. The story of Jesus is now, and the story of Jesus is also the future. The story of Jesus is continuing. It's not over and done, the end. Nope, not even close. And so as we look at now and we look at the future, you have already been introduced on Sunday morning to a team that is discerning for our church. How do we live out this mission? And what does God want us to look at, focus, pray about, prioritize now and in the near future? What is the vision for this church to live out that mission? And and so I would like to uh, present to you again the leader of the Way Ahead team, Randy Burke. Now, last uh, weekend, we came out to the Sunday school classes and asked for input, and we got a lot of input, a lot of passion input. It was, it was, it was heartening to see that. And uh, I even went back and, uh, on the second service, and I talked to, the, to Peggy and Linda, who take her in the child care. They gave me great input. And then I went to Walmart in the frozen section, and I got some more input. And Jan, I would have stayed longer, but I was getting cold. So we appreciate your input. It will always make this better. Now, if you don't want to talk, if, you're not, if there, you'd rather not talk face to face, or if you would, uh, there's an there's a email right up there. Okay? Fumicvision at gmail.com. And that will, come, that will come with me, and I will share it with the, with the group. Now, if you send an email in and, and all you get from me is a got it, thanks, it's because I, I will take that and we will talk about it around the group. And the stuff that we talk about in the group, the substance is not secret. Who it comes from, we're going to kind of keep that because oh, so-and-so said this and so-and-so said that. We don't, we're not going to do any of that stuff there. So anonymous input. Now, next Sunday, and I apologize to the Sunday school leaders, uh, and let me know if you have a problem with this. We'd like to come out and ask you the question that's right up here. Given our mission statement, that one up there, the one that's not in Chinese, but that one back there, what do you want the church to look like? What would it be? What, it would, what it, would it be able to do? And I want you to consider possibilities. Limitations will come later. I know we have limitations, but what is possible? And we'll talk to you next week. Thanks. You see that email address up there? That will be included in your All Church update this week. That will, is already on the church website. If you go to the tab that says adults, there's a whole section on leadership uh, on that page. And it talks about our board, the nominations committee, which is also meeting later today. You could say a prayer for them. Uh, And it also talks about this team, and that email address is there with a link. Uh, So they do want your feedback. We will be sending it out on Facebook this week. So uh, please take advantage of that. We're also interested in feedback from people who don't necessarily belong to this church. What does Monette want in a church? What is Pierce City looking for? What, what, What would Purdy appreciate from a church? We want to know. And, and so this isn't just for us, okay? It is, it is us, but it is more than us. And so I greatly appreciate the work of this team uh, because, like we said, Jesus' story isn't over and done, and we get to be part of it. And, and so as we're looking at storytelling today, this is part of that. Um, I invite you also to be sure you get a bulletin today if you don't have one. Um, you might look at these lovely blue bulletins. I'm just kidding. I know it's green. And, and uh, why are we printing them on colored paper? We're printing them on colored paper because, well, for one, it's fun. But also, we have found that it is a lot less expensive to make black and white copies on colored paper than it is to make color copies on white paper. So that's what we're going to do for a little while. So you can see what weird color did Brian decide to choose that week. You get to be surprised by that. The bulletin is also always online, and you can get that if you go to our webpage and click the watch tab or the online tab and you can push a button and get the weekly bulletin there in PDF uh, and uh, it is available to you that way. Uh, <clears throat> the reason I want you to have this also is important things coming up. You see there will be a potluck again on November the 5th 
And I mention that right now because that will be the first time when Randy Burke and the team you just heard about are going to share their findings. So that's going to be part of that potluck brunch on the 5th. I also want to point out, uh, and we want to appreciate him in person today, I announced last week that Jerry had accepted position as Director of Traditional Worship, but he wasn't able to be with us last week, so we want to formally welcome him in person and thank Jerry uh, as he has taken that position. And if you are interested in vocals at all for this worship service, whether you used to or you do or you're interested Pay attention to this. Jerry is having a meeting for all singers or people who might like to sing for this worship service coming up in two weeks. And it's early, so you need to get here early that Sunday if you would like to be part of that. One other thing I want to let you know about one week from today, too, that missed the bulletin, and that's my fault. Next Sunday is Butter Braid Tasting Sunday. Mm -hmm. The Small Wonders Preschoolers will be in the lobby with their butter braid fundraiser, including aromas and samples, so delicious, and they could take cash or check. Uh, my understanding is they'll also have some computer terminals available to even take credit card payment, okay? And you're giving it for that fundraiser, support Small Wonders Preschool, what they do. That's next Sunday. And, and you will also see a fun video and some other things from Small Wonders Preschool. So mark your calendar for the 15th. It's gonna be a Small Wonders Focus Sunday. I am happy to tell you some updates for the prayers in the bulletin. Kenny Fertig is with us today. Praise God. <laughs> Donna Patterson is home and recovering. You can help them out with meals if you like. See the details there. Connor and Carter McLean are both home. <laughs> and I said to Austin, I said, Austin, how can we help you? He said, can you give me sleep? <laughs> We'll work on that. So you see others listed here to pray for. If you want us to pray for someone, please mark that on your yellow card or use the website there in your bulletin. It is our pleasure to pray for you. If you want only staff to see it, uh, then that is fine. But if you want it to be shared, mark that box and, and we will include your prayer request in weekly updates. Thinking about stories and storytelling, and by the way, I will explain this in a minute. That's part of my story. What's your story? Storytelling seems to me that it should be a natural part of living in the Ozarks. This is a storytelling place. I know this is a storytelling place because I had to learn this when I moved here from Los Angeles. And I pulled up to the gas station in Kimberling City, Missouri, which is where we lived at the time. We went from 14 million people to 2,500 people. It was really, really good therapy. But anyway, uh, so I was at the gas station in Kimberling City, and uh, this, this fella uh, on the other side of the pump from me says, hey, how you doing? I was like, blah! <laughs> like, people don't talk to each other at the gas station in Los Angeles. They just, they don't do that. They don't do that. And so this guy asked my name and told me his name and then proceeded to tell me all these things about his family and, you know, the lake and what they were doing and da 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 and, and I thought, well, this is different. And, and uh, the other thing I had to learn, and my wife told me, if someone waves at you or does this on the steering wheel, you're supposed to wave back. It's like, oh, glad you cleared that up. I thought that was a gang sign and you might get shot. So um, I had to learn these things when I moved here from urban America. It all goes along with friendliness, which is a great asset to this area, but also storytelling is just naturally a part of life in the 417. It just is. People tell stories all the time. My wife is a novelist. She tells stories, and she also helps people act out stories in theater. By the way, props to um, a couple from our congregation, Atlas and Caleb, our youth who are in the community theater production of The Orphan Train right now. And so we're very proud of them and excited for them as they have their last performance today. My wife comes from a family of storytellers, and so this was not new to her, and I've just kind of had to learn as I go. My hope, though, is simply by being here and drinking the water, you're at least somewhat familiar with stories and storytelling culture, and this is a good and biblical thing to do as well, and we'll talk about that. But now, we can tell stories in ways that are harmful. We can tell stories in ways that, that are 
offensive. We can tell stories in ways that don't help. And I think that is the mindset behind the caution in this uh, popular song. I'm going to put up lyrics from Heathens by 21 Pilots. And the two guys who are 21 Pilots, and this is a band that's been pretty popular for about eight years now, they are both followers of Jesus. Um, But they wouldn't badge themselves as a Christian band. What's interesting is their caution about witnessing and evangelism in this song, all my friends are heathens, take it slow. Wait for them to ask you who you know. Please don't make any sudden moves. You don't know the half of the abuse. Sometimes in the name of evangelism, people have done some pretty horrendous things. Of course, televangelists and, you know, pay for healing and things like that, scams may come to mind. But there are also other times when people have been just downright insensitive, rude, judgmental, harsh. Well, uh, you know, maybe a picture's worth a thousand words. Let's just put up this next one here. You might have seen some things like this. And I'm not saying that signs never have a place ever. There is a campaign that advertised in this last year, including on the Super Bowl, that was He Gets Us, talking about how Jesus can relate to us. That was well done. But sometimes signs can be harmful. Repent or perish. Well, first of all, in this day and age, people don't have any idea what repent means. So that's probably not very helpful. Um, And then please pull in. It's like, does this make you look invited and like you want to go in and talk more to this person? Probably not. Um, The devil's hell is inside the earth. That's an interesting one. Um, No more delays. Jesus is coming soon. Get ready. Okay, there could be some Bible truth there. But again, it's, it's just this... There's all kinds of things to unpack here, and I'm not going to do it today. But suffice it to say, evangelism can be done in a way that is not winsome, that is not loving, that is not seeking relationship and the best for the other person. And all those things are what Jesus is. So if we're going to tell people about Jesus, we've got to do it in a way that reflects Jesus. Tim Keller, who recently passed away, a pastor in New York City I greatly respect, had had this comment to say about evangelism. Bad evangelism says, I'm right, you're wrong, and I'd love to tell you about it. You might have met somebody like this or know someone like this. That approach typically doesn't go far. So what approach should we have? Well, Paul was writing a letter, wrote two of them, in fact, to the church in Corinth. And we have these letters in our New Testament. They've been preserved and kept for us by the Holy Spirit and inspired by the Holy Spirit through Paul, the human author, to tell us more about how to live as a Christian, including how to share our faith. Corinth was a very cosmopolitan-type city with people who worshipped all different kinds of gods. It was a port. Uh, Nearby Kenkre was the port, so there were people from all over the world. It was, was, uh, honestly, a lot like modern-day Los Angeles. And, and so we can learn from what Paul said about how you should represent Christ in a place like that. It applies here as well. So let's take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14, 15. Hear God's word. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone, so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. And so a very important thing that we could take from these verses and elsewhere in Scripture, and if you're following along with your bulletin, this is the first fill-in, God wants all people. Some will reject God. But then I've added, didn't have space in the bulletins. Others will say yes to God. And only God knows what decision people will make. Neutrogena has kind of a funny tagline in their new commercials that Neutrogena is for people with skin. Okay, so that's for everybody, right? Well, you can go farther than that. Cross apply, that's what we're talking about today. Jesus is for people who breathe. Everybody needs Jesus. And a really wonderful thing that we see in Scripture is that Jesus wants everyone. There is nobody Jesus doesn't want. There is nobody Jesus has just rejected outright or said, no, yeah, I made you, but decided, nah, forget it. That's not the heart 
of our Savior. Our Savior wants everyone to know him and come to saving and life transformational relationship with him. It says that over and over again in scripture. So, is it God's will to pray for that person you know who doesn't have any meaningful relationship with a church? And I'm going to say that because that's an indicator of their relationship with Jesus. You and I can't judge a heart, right? We can't know exactly where someone stands with Christ, but we can see do they have any kind of relationship at all with the church? If they don't, chances are, if they have faith, it's not a healthy and growing one, okay? So, so we're not judging where someone is with Jesus because you and I can't do that. But we can see, do they have any kind of meaningful connection with the church? That's why we ask you here on prayer every time, you're one, pray for someone with no meaningful connection to a church. And it is always Jesus' will to pray for that person to take a step towards Jesus, to come to know Jesus. Always God's will to pray for that. And you might be thinking, but this person just, you know, seems like an impossible case. This person wants nothing to do with God. This person has all these reasons why not to believe in God. And I have a cousin like that. And sometimes it's difficult to sit down and talk with him because he can be very caustic about it. He does have some good reasons with, with his past and things he's been taught and things he's experienced to be very skeptical of faith. But I also know, and I've been praying for my cousin this week, because his mother, my aunt, died last weekend. And, and so he and I got to have a heart-to-heart on the phone this week. Um, and I may be going to Iowa soon for a funeral. And we got to talk. And I do see that God is at work in his life. And, and so you just don't know. You just don't know, friends. No one is beyond God's reach. And therefore, we should consider that nobody is someone we should ignore when it comes to telling our story and sharing our faith. We don't know who's going to say yes. We don't know who's going to say no. But you got to, you know, leave that decision in their hands and the work supernaturally that God is doing in that person's life. But that brings forth the question, who do you know? Who do you know? Think about who you're connected with. Your family, if you have a relationship I realize there are some people, you know, some family members are related to you by blood. You don't talk to them, okay? So you may not really know them. I get that. Um, your friends. Usually Americans, by survey, have at least three to seven close friends. And this could be new and old friends, friends you see face-to-face, or phone call friends. You know, one of my best friends lives in Philadelphia. Uh, but we are still very close. Talk on the phone at least a few times a year. Those who live near you, your neighbors. You might be thinking, but I live in the middle of the country. Well, you still have neighbors, but they may also be people that you just closely associate with elsewhere, like in Walmart. You know, you might be getting to know your Walmart check person. Yeah, you might use the self-checkout, but you could also decide not to do that and talk to a human checker and get to know that person. That person could be considered your neighbor as you're getting to know them could also be your server at Angus Branch or wherever. Neighbor can be interpreted more broadly than the person who lives geographically next to you. Those who join you in sports, hobbies, or clubs, who do you know? Who do you play pickleball with? You know, who do you do service club with? Who do you play cards with? Who do you know? Out of those people you know, ask God to open your eyes and show you who needs your prayers. Who has no meaningful connection with any church? What if you got together with that person this week? We'll talk more about that in a moment. But I want you to be able to identify out of this list somebody who Jesus has placed on your heart as your one. Now, if you look at this list and you say, well, all of the people I know who in those categories already belong to a church, well and good. So pray for God to cross your path with someone who doesn't. And I believe that God will do that. And I also find it hard to believe if if these things apply to you in Monette, Missouri, that every single person you know is meaningfully connected to a church. Because let me tell you, the Ministerial Association here got together a couple years ago and did some numbers, and this was pre-pandemic to be sure, but it's probably not improved since then, that on any given Sunday in this town, only about three out of ten people are with any church at all anywhere. So that means the majority are not connected. And so we have a story to share with them. But how we do that is really important. So we're continuing with 1 Corinthians in our reading. Let's look at the next verse I'm going to put on the screen. Uh, If we could back up one. There we go. 
So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. It is very easy to have the mindset of evangelism that we are selling Jesus. Or we're sharing Jesus to get a notch on my look how holy I am vest. That is a worldly point of view. That's not what this is about. This kind of thing is not what we're talking about today. And by the way, this is a spoof. And I'm glad because if it were real, that's very disturbing. This is a worldly point of view. That's not what we're doing. We're not marketing Jesus, okay? That's not what evangelism is about. And let's continue with next verses here. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You've noticed I've underlined those words. And when you think of reconcile, you might think of a checkbook. And for those who were born after the year 2000, a checkbook is something that's paper in a book and you use it with the bank and you write things in it to pay for stuff. Anyway, um, but when you write a check in your checkbook, what else do you have to write in your checkbook? You have to write what you did in the ledger, right? Why? Because you have to go back later and reconcile your checkbook to make sure that what you have on record matches what the bank says. And in my household, I have been forbidden from doing this because my wife needs for the checkbook to match the bank statement to the penny in order to be happy. I don't need that to be happy, but she does, and so I let her reconcile the checkbook. And that sounds about as exciting as watching paint dry, I know. But reconcile has a bigger and more important meaning. Sometimes a picture's worth a thousand words, so I'm going to put up some pictures of what reconciliation looks like. This is what it looks like. Both of these are photographs of, um, a, a, as I was reading about it, a, a child grown and young who, you know, was either you know, disciplined or at odds with their dad, but then later was embraced. And I think there's a story in Luke about that too. The prodigal son is a story of reconciliation. You never outgrow your need for it, and Jesus offers it for us. Jesus made it possible for us to be reconciled to our creator. We've been selfish, we've been disobedient, but because of what Jesus did, we can be embraced. He has taken away the bad between us and our creator. He's given us a clean slate and a fresh start. That's reconciliation. And everybody of every age needs this. And so we get to be a part of that. Christian author Philip Yancey put it well. I'm going to put this quote up here. Rather, God has commissioned us as agents of intervention in the midst of a hostile and broken world. In our Corinthian letter today, it says we are ambassadors. We are ambassadors of reconciliation. We are human agents of a supernatural work. How awesome is that? When you're telling your story, when your life is Jesus-informed and Jesus-infused, and you're telling your story, it's not just you. The Holy Spirit is at work. And I know that because... The summer before my senior year of college, I was serving on a short-term missions team in Boston, Massachusetts that was helping a couple churches that were getting started in that city. And we were with a team that was going door-to-door -door in the neighborhood of one of those churches, letting people know about the new church. And, and one thing that we'd, we'd offer was to pray with people, um, and we'd also ask them, and this is a good question, this is an alpha question borrowed from them, and by the way, we'll probably do that alpha program again soon, okay? Alpha's good stuff. A key question from Alpha, and one that we posed when we were in Boston, if you could ask God one question, what would it be? You get some interesting responses to that. Well, I remember that there was a lady whose door we knocked on, and she came out on the patio, and we asked her, you know, if you could ask God one question, what would it be? And she said, how can I know God loves me? And so I proceeded to, to try to share about Jesus with her, and it was awful friends. It was so bad. It made no sense what I was saying. It was just, you know, might as well have been speaking Swahili. I thought it was terrible. But at the end of that, she said, thank you. I do feel loved. And then she let us pray for her. 
thought, how on earth did she get that from what I said? It wasn't me. It was God's spirit at work in her spirit. And God knew that we would meet her on her porch that day at that time. And God knew that she needed to hear whatever gobbledygook I said. Because the Holy Spirit used it. Now, what can get in the way of a supernatural work? Well, we have to check what's our motivation when it comes to witness, when it comes to sharing our faith. There's some different motivations. Sometimes people share their faith out of fear. Something like, if I don't tell this person about Jesus, they might die in a car accident tonight and go to hell forever. That is a very small view of God, friends. And it's also not scriptural. You know, while Jesus does say that he's coming back, while Jesus does talk about a time when people will receive what they're due based on their decisions. The idea that we need to share Jesus with everyone right now because something horrible and tragic might happen, that's not the right motivation. Jesus was not about motivating based on fear. Our God is not a God of fear, but of love and of truth. So that's not our motivation. Some people, it's guilt. Oh, I got to share my faith because... It's the right thing to do, and I just I feel bad about myself if I don't evangelize. And again, Christianity is not about guilt, friends. That's missing the good news of the gospel. This is good news, remember. This is a hopeful story. It's not about guilt. Duty. Well, I gotta do it. And so some people approach sharing their faith like they approach serving on a jury. By the way, jury duty is a pretty special thing in this country, let me tell you. In China, you don't get no jury trial. And even a lot of places in Europe, you just have to hope the judge likes you because there's no jury. That's actually a very special thing in our culture. And so I want to redeem jury duty, hopefully, in your eyes today, okay, that it is important, even if it can be hard, even if it can be a sacrifice. And in that way, sharing your faith might be as well. A sacrifice for you. Something that takes some extra thought, prayer, and effort on your part. But it's important, and it's worth doing because of love. That's our motivation. That we love other people enough that we want to share this old, old story we sang about with them because it'll change their life now and forever. And talking about motivation, that's why I'm wearing this today. Okay, This is my fraternity jersey from college. It's a little bit tighter now, but I can still wear it. And I want to tell you about one of my fraternity brothers called Brandon. And Brandon and I rushed together and we pledged together and we were in the fraternity together and had a great time together. We were good friends. We lived next to each other in the dormitory. And last Monday was the 20-year anniversary of Brandon dying in a car accident. And it was a single car accident. We don't know if it was intentional or not. Only God knows. Honestly, excursus here. Even if it was intentional... A suicide does not automatically separate someone from God. I do not find in Scripture, Christ died for the forgiveness of all our sins, oh, except that one, not that one. I don't find that in Scripture, okay? That does not mean that ending your life is a good choice, but it does mean for those who have lost a loved one to suicide, you need to know that Jesus is present in that too, You need to know that suicide does not automatically separate someone from God. Because how are we made right with God? By faith. And so it's the person's faith that matters, not the manner in which they die. But this was a tough thing for me with Brandon because I didn't know what his faith was or where he stood. And it was a lot of grief uh, for me after he died. Like that, because for one, I was at a fairly young age. I hadn't lost somebody quite that like that before. But also, um, I, I just I felt awful about it. I felt like I could have and should have done something differently with Brandon, so there could be some assurance that he was with Jesus. And so, as I was just kind of anguished over this, God spoke to me, and God said, "Were you a friend to him?" Yeah. Did you pray for him? Yeah, I did. Did you ask Brandon if you could pray for him? And I had a few times, especially there was a summer I was home in New Mexico. I never stayed in Texas during the summer on purpose. 
Uh, and I was home in New Mexico, but he had a surgery, and he was in the hospital in Waco, and so we got to talk on the phone, and I got to pray with him then. And other times, you know, God brought to my mind, did you invite him to, to worship or to Bible study with you? And I had. Brandon always said no. But what God said was, Brian, you did what you knew to do. You did not know this was going to happen. You didn't foresee this coming. You did what you knew to do, and you did what I had put on your heart. So you have to leave the rest to me. That is evangelism, friends. Remember, it's God's work, not our work. It's a supernatural work. And if God has laid it on your heart to call someone or send him a text, man, go ahead and send him a text right now or get together with them this week. I'm not saying that's wrong and bad to take action. But if you are taking action based on what God has put on your heart to do, then you're being obedient. Regardless of whether that person makes a Christian commitment with you or not, if you have helped them to see something more about God or to view Jesus in a way maybe they hadn't before or to take a step in faith, and maybe just letting you pray for them is a big step in faith, even if they're not sure it does anything, but they're willing to say, hey, yeah, go right ahead because they can see that it, it means something for you. That's big. That's big. And that's loving. Do not beat yourself up or be racked with fear or guilt for evangelism. Now, I still miss Brandon a whole lot. I wish that that had not happened. And yeah, I do wish that I had known of a Christian commitment in Brandon's life before he passed away. Of course I wish that. But I don't know what Brandon's last moments of life were like. And, and to be honest, I don't really even know what the last year before that car accident was like very much in his life because I was living in California at the time and he was still in Texas. You know, we weren't in real close contact. God is at work. And so if you have prayed for someone to know Jesus, trust that God is hearing that prayer. And people still have their own free will and their own decisions, but God has heard your prayer and don't give up. And do what God has placed on your heart to love that person, befriend that person, be truthful with that person, but always in love. That's what it means to evangelize. I'm going to put up a slide here that kind of shows what we're talking about with stories. Your story and God's story, if you know Jesus, you know that God's story is you are saved by grace through faith. You know your story and your friend's story, or your family member's story, your loved one's story. You know your relationship and how you're connected with each other. You have history together. What about the other person? Like we said before, nobody Jesus doesn't want. God is wooing that person, drawing that person to himself. Scripture says that. You may not see that, but that's what Scripture says. There's nobody God doesn't want, and God is always making his appeal and drawing people to God in supernatural ways. To continue with our Corinthians passage today, let's put that up there. God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ, not counting their sins against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. For us, God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. So here we have God's story on the right-hand side and our story on the left. Know your story within God's story. And also don't forget to ask about the other person's story. Let's talk a little bit what that, that looks like. So talking to your one, invite them to talk about what they think or believe, what they feel, their experiences, what they're reading or watching, their hopes, their dreams, their frustrations, and really listen, okay? You're not just trying to get them to share so that you can jump in and share what you want to share. That's not, there's no agenda here. You're really listening to what the other person thinks. Let things arise naturally. And they may ask you about what you're reading, thinking, experiencing, feeling. Your dreams, hopes, frustrations. You may have the chance to share spiritual truth in turn, but let it be natural. Let it arise naturally. And I believe it will. I've seen this happen many times in my own life. Surprise me, you know, usually when I least expect it. You know, sitting down with somebody that I have only met a few times playing racquetball, and he tells me that he was raised in the Jehovah's Witness Church and was telling me more about it. He's not still active in that. But, we, you know, it opened a very natural door for a spiritual conversation. You never know as you're getting to know someone and honestly paying attention to them and interested in their lives what will happen. Let's go to the next slide. Your story. You can talk about what you think, believe, feel, your experiences, 
what you're reading or watching, your hopes, your dreams, your frustrations, and you don't have to be a know-it-all. Remember Tim Keller? I'm right, you're wrong, and I'd love to tell you about it. That's not what we're doing here. It's okay to not have all the answers. But you can talk about when have you seen God come through for you? Or, being completely authentic, how are you continuing to believe even when you didn't see what you hoped for? Man, that's compelling to people. You know, your life is not a bowl of cherries, but you still believe. How is that? That's real. You can also talk about what's something you admire or appreciate about Jesus. And God's story. And God's story is huge. But sometimes it can be condensed in pictures. This is one that's popular right now. He came, that's Jesus, of course. He died, he rose, that's the empty tomb there. He ascended, he's coming back again. There's the whole Bible story in a few little lines. I don't love this one, though, because it's not very personal. It's more just kind of abstract. Here's another way to depict God's story and drawings. It's a little more personal. God created us in love. That's that first heart and circle. But then in our sin, we broke our relationship. And so we can continue to run away. That's the squiggly lines. Or we can turn back, which is what repent means, and believe. And when we do that, Jesus makes us right. He can do it because he is in charge. He's the king. And so we recover and we pursue God again. And we have a loving relationship. And what I love about this is you can see the cyclical nature of it, that we do have a loving relationship with God, but we will still sin. And when we do, we can turn back again, receive forgiveness from Jesus, and continue in love. This, you know, none of us will ever stop sinning because we're human. God understands that. But God has made a way for us to be reconciled and come back with him if we're willing. How would you depict God's story? And the beautiful thing about pictures is you could do this with any age. You know, you might sit down with your grandkids or your kids and, you know, hey, you know, how would you draw what Jesus has done for you? And it could be a very good thing to do. If nothing else, because sometimes, like we talked about before, when you write it down, it becomes that much more real and true in your life. So I don't know what this message has said to you today, but I want you to know that I'm praying for you. And I'm praying for you as you are praying for your one and seeking God's action and transformation in the life of your one. And I'd ask you to pray for me as well as I do the same. I know it's not easy. And that's part of the fact that it's supernatural, friends. This is not a cut and dry thing, but it's good. And it's the mission we have been given. And it can transform the world. Nothing changes a life no one changes a life like Jesus Christ, and you and I get to be a part of it. So let's close our worship by singing and remembering that we have a story to tell the nations. Let's stand as we sing. Turn this beat.
you might be sitting here thinking, Ryan, that sounds great and all, but I don't know what to say. I don't know what to tell them. And my, my example to tell you is exactly what I tell my kids. Go back to the songs. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's easy. You can say that. Another one, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved this wretch by me. I once was lost, but now I'm fine. Was blind, but now I see. You have the story. Don't let it be kept silent. I pray for you guys this week that God will use you to use the story that he has written for you and have an awesome impact on our community. We pray this in your name, Father. Have a great week, guys. Oh, I was told to, uh, an, to announce that today is Pastor Appreciation Day. Is that all you wanted me to say? Okay, Pastor Appreciation Day is today. Hooray! Hooray. <laughs>